the challenge, the opportunity to connect. The 1960s, a time of imagination and change, a time of anger and fear. The 1960s, a program called Challenge. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Looked at our connections, our divisions, through the lens of faith. Nearly 60 years later, during these challenging times, we'll take a new look at our divisions, our connections, in a new program called Challenge 2.0. In last week's episode of Challenge 2.0, we looked at the re-emergence of anti-Semitism, prejudice against Jews, or even those perceived to be Jewish. Although anti-Semitism has never disappeared, the shooting and resulting deaths at synagogues in Pennsylvania and California make it clear that it has entered a new and more violent phase in our country's history. We continue that discussion in this episode of Challenge 2.0 and examine potential responses. So we are welcoming back this week the guests that we had on last week to help give us foundation and a better understanding of anti-Semitism and perhaps the most needed responses to that. So I would like to welcome back our panelists, Mel Damsky, a former Newsday reporter. Uh, you may not recognize Mel, but you definitely recognize his work because you're a TV and film director. And from what I recall, you said you've done 40 films and more than 100 TV episodes, including MASH. Several hundred. Several hundred. <laughs> Yes. And that includes Hallmark movies and that sort of thing. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, Max Potashnik uh, from the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle, and you are the Director of Government and Com Community Relations. Yes, guilty. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. And Rabbi Daniel Weiner, who's a uh, repeat guest, and we thank you so much for coming back. Senior Rabbi at Temple to Hirsch Sinai, which has campuses both in Seattle and Bellevue. And as always, we appreciate your perspective and your ability to articulate that so very well. It's an honor. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to pick up almost directly from where we left off last week. Uh, I was interested to read a quote from former FBI Director James Comey, who we've heard of in a number of different connections, who said, in a heartbeat, words can turn to violence. So far, we've talked about words. Uh, hate does not remain static for long. Uh, history points us to the Holocaust, and yet despite the magnitude of this horror, all the proof, the body of proof of evidence that exists, we continue to get people that are denying that it ever happened. Uh, so I'd ask a two-part question, really. Number one, what is your personal experience with the Holocaust? And number two, faced with such evidence, why and how can denial exist? Mel? Mel, we might begin I, with you, because you I am going to just uh, show you this. And this is my family in Lithuania. My father was born in Lithuania. and. Uh, these wonderful people, and they're surrounded by trees just like we are here. I don't think it's a surprise that I ended up uh, where I am, because this is where my forefathers are. And most of the people in this picture were murdered by the people they grew up with, who were not Nazis, who were not German. They were Lithuanians who were influenced by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And they, this is, my uncle Max, whom I'm named for, he served his country, came home, and was taken with his wife and children to the edge of town and shot and killed by the people he grew up with. So uh, that's, for me, obviously an incredible burden, right, to grow up with that. And my parents tried to sh shield me from it as much as possible. But as I started to get interested in the family history, uh, it really became a huge, it had a huge impact on me. So when I hear someone denying, if somebody said it to my face, I would get violent. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I was captain of the football team. I was a wrestler. There is that side of me. That's why I'm sitting this far away. From I know. <laughs> yeah, in case you say something that upsets me. I mean, this, I can't tell you how upsetting it is when I hear somebody denying this happened. When I... These are, this is my family they're talking about. That's history. For you, you have a very direct connection with yes. that. Max or okay. Rabbi? I don't know if there is, is really any Jewish person who doesn't grow up in some way connected to the Holocaust, whether that's, that's for good or, or for worse for that individual and their connection with Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I was really fortunate because 
Um, my family came over before the Holocaust. They were fleeing violence um, pogroms in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. um, violence, organized violence against against the Jewish community. And um, so I learned about it, you know, growing up. I learned about it in Hebrew school. I learned about it in going to the the Holocaust Museum um, in in D.C. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Israel, so going to Yad Vashem and, and the museum there. Um, and I would say, I mean, it's it's incredibly tragic, and it's it's impossible to understand the scope and the the depth and the magnitude of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, this last summer, I had the opportunity to go to Eastern Europe and spend some time in Prague and Budapest. Um, and so spending time in the, um, the traditional Jewish spaces there, mm -hmm. seeing some of the Holocaust memorials, um, really was brought at home for me in, in more of a personal way um, than I felt, I think, thus far in my life. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit off track and I'll come back, but really I, one of the things I think about in terms of, you know, how can this happen and why does this exist, right? Mm -hmm. Holocaust denial is certainly a form of anti-Semitism. I mean, I, I think that that's fairly obvious. And I think about the Anti-Defamation League has um, this tool they use called the Pyramid of Hate. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of the Pyramid of Hate is um, harassment and bullying and that sort of thing. And at the top of the pyramid is genocide. And um, the EDL very much believes, and I would say I, I believe this as well, that hate is learned and hate can also be unlearned. And so one of the things I think about is what are we doing today um, to help children, young people, even older people, um, so that we don't allow people to move along this pyramid of hate unchecked? How do we, how do we um, check in and provide people with the right education and interventions at the lowest level um, so that we can make sure that it doesn't happen again, though we know, unfortunately, genocide continues to happen and is still happening today. You know, I didn't, fortunately, I did not have any, you know, very direct uh, family members who perished in the Shoah and the Holocaust. Most of my family came over before. Um, but as a Jew growing up in the 20th century, mid 20th century, it, it certainly was a significant lens through which we understood our place in history, understood mm -hmm. our place in the world, understood our place vis-a-vis -vis contemporary geopolitics. But as Max was saying, Holocaust denial is absolutely a form of anti-Semitism. Uh, within the kind of penumbrum, the guise of being an intellectual pursuit, just because there are perverse, uh, uh, skewed academics who uh, couch their Holocaust denial within a framework of academic rigor doesn't make it any less anti-Semitic. But also, um, the notion that Jews somehow exploit and leverage the Holocaust in order to uh, elicit empathy or to found the state of Israel or to better secure their place in this country, that's also a pernicious, insidious, and um, uh, increasingly overt form of anti-Semitism that we're experiencing these days. You can certainly understand where if one group does not like another, they may say that something that might place a different picture than the narrative they like, uh, therefore is suspect or they'll deny it. But this larger range of denialism, and by the way, uh, you were talking about academics, there was an excellent movie called Denial, based on the story of Deborah Lipstadt, who was, I think, a guest of your synagogue not that long ago. Uh, but why are we seeing more and more denial of, you know, f couched in the phrases of alt-truth, why are we seeing more of that? Do you have an overall suspicion why even beyond the experience of your faith community we're seeing more of that? I think it's just a reflection of, again, the haters coming out of the closet and, and uh, this insidious thing that's been simmering under the surface and that's a perfect way to express it. Mm -hmm. To say to Jews, oh, stop complaining about something that never happened. Stop making, tr acting like you're victims. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's just another version of hatred. Or engaging in comparative suffering, saying, you know, you Jews want the world to just be concerned about your suffering. Well, what about all the other suffering that's occurred in the world? Somehow you Jews want special treatment and focus uh, at, the, at the expense of other groups. That's a more subtle, yet a, an increasingly uh, evident form of anti-Semitism. To me also, it goes back to the point of technology, right? Mm -hmm. I think we can, we could live an entire day, we can create the world and the reality in which we want to live, mm -hmm. interact, 
fairly or solely with the people who believe the same way we do, follow the only the news streams that um, exactly. right propagate the same things that we believe. And so there's an opportunity for that to flourish in spots and have a broader reach again than it it may have in the in the past. Wherever you live in the world, you can find a community of like-minded people online, and that really exacerbates the problem. And at the risk of trivial, trivializing uh, the Holocaust, which I certainly don't want to do, but I think there is a larger phenomenon, and you made mention of it, just the whole idea of fake news, alternative facts, mm -hmm. the idea of distrust of authority and science. I mean, I think there is something similar on the spectrum where, where the, it, the increase in anti-vaxxers, I think, yes. is of a piece of those who would say science, scientific authority shouldn't be trusted, historical authority shouldn't be trusted, political authority shouldn't be trusted. And once all of that is kind of up for grabs and you have kind of an ideological and cultural chaos, again, Jews who are often the most vulnerable groups within the societies in which they've lived, mm -hmm. oftentimes are the first who are victimized by that kind of cultural sea change. It struck me, Mel, when you were showing us the picture of your family and you said, these people were not executed by Nazis. They were executed by their neighbors. In this community, your faith community has had a history of speaking out on behalf of others that have been marginalized, that have been subject to prejudice. I think of the forerunner of this program, Challenge, which the basic concept was designed when John F. Kennedy was running for president. There was a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment. And the person that came up with the idea was your predecessor, uh, Rabbi Raphael Levine at Temple de Hirsch, who said, we need to look at this and build bridges. What troubles you the most of the reaction or relative inaction of those within Christian faith communities? I think you should start. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have deep relationships with. Things. You know, first, uh, first and foremost, um, uh, you know, I have to say that um, uh, my my colleagues in the other faith communities in 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 this uh, in this area have been incredibly receptive and responsive to mm -hmm. um, uh, incidents of anti-Semitism, and really um, all the faith communities have been there for one another when there has been a more dramatic or more extreme act, either within our region or or nationally or globally. Mm -hmm. um, I think of um, the uh, uh, synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh uh, last fall, and many communities had broad vigils. We had one here as well where the community came together, and I, and I have to tell you, we had 5,000 people there mm -hmm. uh, at, temple, at Temple, and, and Max and the Jewish Federation were you know, key co-sponsors of that. Um, and you know, more people were not Jewish than were Jewish who attended. Um, and that to me is a, an incredible, um, incredible reflection of um, the, the support that so many of us, it doesn't mean that it's perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly, and we may get to this, when it comes to disagreements about what the state of Israel represents in terms of Jewish identity and how does that comport with kind of its current policies, mm -hmm. that's where sometimes I am seeing more of a, um, of, a, of, a, of a point of friction mm -hmm. and of conflict over um, what, is, what we might perceive as anti-Semitic and what some other groups would see as a legitimate criticism of Israel. We might blend that together then and feel free to respond to both aspects of that. One flash point does indeed seem to be the policies of the state of Israel. Uh, when there's criticism of the policies of state of Israel, is that automatically tantamount to being anti-Semitic or where does the line fall on that? Absolutely not. I, I am very critical of the current government in Israel. I'm not a BB fan. And uh, I think that you can be absolutely critical of Israel. That doesn't mean you're an anti-Semite and they should not be conflated. They're, they're, they're two totally separate things. I'm very critical of the government of the United States right now, but I'm still pro-America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the, I, the devil is in the details. And I will tell you that um, of the six months that we have spent trying to, the Federation has spent bringing people together to craft a community statement on anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. where the rubber met the road time and time again was where it, where it comes to Israel. And so um, there, are, there are some pieces that I think certainly cross the line. For example, holding the entirety of the Jewish people accountable for the actions of the state of Israel, mm -hmm. that is, that is, that is anti-Semitic. 
or comparing actions of the contemporary Israeli government to that of the Nazis. That is, that is also anti-Semitic. Um, denying the Jewish people the right to self-determination. By that I mean the denying the Jewish people's historical and religious connection to the land of Israel and saying that the creation of the state of Israel was a racist endeavor while not having any other issue with, I would say, the um, imperfect way in which virtually every country in the world was created. That can be perceived or land certainly um, to Jews as anti-Semitic. The piece that is, that is often troubling and where there's more gray area is what I would say this double standard, right? Some Jews hold Israel to a higher standard because it's supposed to be a light unto the nations. It's supposed to be an example of, um, of humanity at, it, at its greatest. And um, some Americans hold Israel to a higher standard because there's a lot of U.S. aid that goes to Israel, much of it to protect Israel from in the region it lives, but, but still that case. Or um, Christians who have a close relationship with the Christian Palestinian population, right? So sometimes there is this focus like a laser focus on Israel time and time again mm -hmm. that makes you question what is the motivation behind that? I why why is this happening? And you know, one example that just happened recently was the the California Democratic Party just rejected a number of um, anti-Israel resolutions that were brought up. Among them, some of the content was linking linking the Israeli government officially to the the synagogue massacre in Pittsburgh. And you're like, like where where is this coming from, right? Mm -hmm. And and of all the if these resolutions had passed then all of the statements on Israel would have been more than the Democratic Party would have been saying about Iran, Syria, North Korea, and Russia. And so I can't say, well, the motivation was anti-Semitic, right? But it's like, let's, let's talk about this. Let's understand what's, what um, is underlying this. And I think to me, and I think we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but this goes to what is the, what is the appropriate response to, when, to something you might perceive or or that might land with you as anti-Semitic? Is it calling it out and pushing to the fringes, which used to be the only way to do things? Or is it having a conversation? Is it accepting a heartfelt apology? Is it building allies? Like, like what does that look like? And so I think what we've realized in crafting this statement is that it is, it's one tool, and it's just that. It's a tool in a toolbox, and really, with when it comes to Israel, there's a lot of, there's a lot of complication. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you have to understand what's behind it. And, and one, the last thing I would point back to, though, is also the points that Rabbi Wiener were, was bringing up around college campuses. And right, there's a lot of talk about the movement to delegitimize Israel's right to exist and whether that's anti-Semitic or not and in what sense. And one thing that I would say is that research has shown that on the college campuses where there is a really virulent anti-Israel sentiment, it also creates a more hostile environment for Jewish, Jewish students as a whole, whether they are doing something related to Israel or hosting a Shabbat dinner or a Passover Seder or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever that might or look like. Or have a Jewish name. Sure, or have a Jewish name, right? My colleague um, was who went to Wesleyan when there was a BDS uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions resolution on campus, got harassed for being a Jewish student, not because she had any engagement in this effort one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But so, so trying to look at, and also I think as, as someone who might not be Jewish or not understand the Jewish connection to the land of Israel, be open to learning about that and having a, having a dialogue rather than saying, yes, this is definitely anti-Semitic or no, this isn't, because mm -hmm. I don't think that does any of us any good. Certainly not all criticism of Israel or even anti-Israel rhetoric is anti-Semitic, but some of it is anti-Semitic. And I just want to reiterate what Max said earlier. I think um, if people want to be sensitive and understand where that line is drawn, I think rather than making assumptions yourself and projecting that onto another person who's mm -hmm. different from you, I think you have to ask that person, as, sh as Max was saying, how that, how that lands. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which perhaps started out as a way to pressure Israel internationally to leave the West Bank, to leave the territories, mm -hmm. and allow that to become the basis of a Palestinian state, has absolutely morphed into something different. Mm -hmm. It has morphed into a, 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 an approach and a strategy to delegitimize Israel's right to exist. Um, that is something very different. And for me, and for many others, that really is the red line. And, and just to reiterate what Max was saying, when you say that the Jewish people have no right to self-determination, and when you say the Jewish people, um, uh, the, the state of Israel is a 19th century anachronism, um, that is, um, that is anti-Semitic. Um, you want to talk about boycotting Israel for its current policies? 
um, I'm certainly open to having that conversation. But before we look at Israel in and of itself in terms of its policies, let's look at the 25 other horrific authoritarian genocidal states uh, and nation states that are on the international list and boycott all of those first mm -hmm. before we have a conversation about Israel, which with all of its imperfections is a, um, remains a liberal democracy in a part of the world uh, that lacks any other such kinds of political systems. In preparing for this, I read, at your recommendation, the book Anti-Semitism by uh, Professor Deborah Lipstad, and uh, she described conspiracy theories or the extreme manifestations of bigotry as essentially having a self-sealing quality. That is, people who are really core adherents are essentially insulated from reality and you can't reach them. Uh, so how do you go about either limiting the damage she basically speaks to, there's a certain group that you just basically don't waste your time, but you focus on other means. What are those other means, and do you agree with her, or do you have a more nuanced view of how you'd approach this? I married a Catholic woman. Uh, and again, I grew up with this very, very Jewish background, but, uh, that, you know, I hate to say it, but that's one of the ways to do it is intermarriage is one thing. She's still very Catholic. I'm very Jewish. <clears throat> Father Tracy, who just turned 100 years old, has had a uh, Christmas dinner with us the last two years. Uh, I take Father to Rabbi's Yom Kippur services every year. And, and so I think, again, it's what you do in your own life. You set an example. Mm -hmm. And hopefully other people will pay attention to that. It has to start with, with the individual. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, we want to do it on a much greater l level. And of course, th again, these people can do that in a way that I can't. Mm -hmm. But I think it really begins with what you do in your own life and the example you set to people around you. I think it's hard to say who's reachable and who's unreachable. Mm -hmm. There are always exceptions, right? There are stories, I unfortunately can't remember his name right now, but a really uh, prominent uh, leader of a white supremacist group who is now, I don't want to say on an apology tour, but talking about his being a former white supremacist mm -hmm. um, all around the country and mm -hmm. what he learned and how his views were changed. And so I don't believe that, that anybody is beyond, um, beyond learning and, mm -hmm. and beyond um, reforming, whether that's anti-Semitic or otherwise. I do think it's, with technology again, I do think it's much harder, right? The the way people can get information, reinforce that so quickly, time and time again, over and over. Um, it makes certain populations of people harder to reach. Um, and I would agree with Mel that, you know, it, it does come down to that individual person-to-person -person relationship, mm -hmm. contact, building, um, building alliances. Sometimes it's more simple than we think. Um, you know, I was just uh, meeting with a Jewish community member uh, yesterday, and uh, her daughter's best friend moved two houses down. Her daughter's um, mother is Hindu, and her daughter sorry, her daughter's friend's mother is Hindu, and her father is is Muslim. And the the mother of the the girl said for the second time to the woman in a different context, "Oh, you know, it's just." It's all Jews are rich. I don't know how they get so rich or blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like something like that just in mm -hmm. passing. And, and the community member, she said, you know, um, she didn't mention anything the first time. And she didn't know what to say. She was kind right. of frozen. She said, you know, that, that's actually not true. And, and they had a conversation about it. And the mother of her daughter's friend was like, oh, I, ju I just always thought that that was true. And, and, you know, reaching somebody who has a, mis a common misconception, perhaps like that, versus somebody who is a violent extremist who believes in conspiracy theories is, mm -hmm. is not the same thing. Um, but finding the right tool, the right messenger with the right message, um, I think can work. And again, helping people stay at that lower, lower pyramid of hate, or even off the pyramid of hate altogether would be great. Um, but how do we keep people from moving up? Right. Again, just to reiterate what my august fellow panelists have said, um, Personal relationships, I think, are critical. I think it's, I agree with Professor Lipstadt that I think it is rare to be able to pierce the bubble of delusion and mm -hmm. resistance to, to, to facts and reality that people on the most extreme margins uh, uh, possess. However, um, I think the, the more that we can, through education and through politic and, and, and civil 
confrontation mm -hmm. with uh, anti-Semitic tropes that make it into the mainstream, whether uh, from other faith leaders, uh, uh, shared by other faith leaders, or members of Congress. To be able to confront those, to identify them, to help people to understand that that if they are well intentioned, this was this was a mistake, mm -hmm. and just on a day to day basis, as as Max was saying, to to be able to respond to those um, more mainstreamed kinds of, of of prejudicial views, that I think is where um, where real change and real growth is going to happen. I think that interpersonal connection is a powerful one, and I know I felt very welcome and have felt a great richness uh, within my faith being welcomed in your temple and at a couple of other synagogues as well. And I think certainly you get these echo chambers, as you talked about, where people are used to hearing a certain view, and you uh, related to that, Max. And simply if you see something on Facebook saying, no, that's not right, uh, people are so used to just automatically getting that approval, and suddenly getting disapproval or correction can be a powerful thing as well. Uh, this is not going to be a problem that's going to go away soon. I hope that uh, each of you will come back and join us as we explore this and perhaps even more avenues that we can uh, follow in terms of uh, counteracting some of the current uh, environment that we see in this country. So thank you each so much. Thank you. And thank each of you for joining us on Challenge 2.0. We hope you'll join us again next week.